your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter of the book of Revelation. I had thought last week that this week was going to be our last message. Uh, but two things. One is you realize how much is being said, and you don't want to just jump important things. And so uh, that's one reason that we're not going to conclude this week, but my plans are to conclude next week. The other is, you probably didn't want to sit through a two-hour sermon to make sure I could get all the points in that I wanted. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start, I'm going to read to you verse 12, on, I'll back up and show you some things, and then uh, we'll work our way back into a study that actually begins right where our scripture reading is. So Revelation chapter 22, verse 12, it says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we don't come to Scripture without uh, asking you for your guidance and your help. Um, we know that your Holy Spirit does illuminate us to the words that he inspired on the pages that we're reading. And we do pray for that illumination, uh, for understanding as we look through the passage, and for always instruction and in righteousness as we do. So we pray this in the Savior's name. Amen. Last week, uh, when we got to Revelation chapter uh, 22, verse 11, uh, we kind of just jumped immediately to verse 13 because I wanted to conclude uh, in verse 13. Uh, verse 11 is like a warning. Verse 13 ends by saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking about himself, Alpha and Omega, that's the first and the last alphabet of the Greek, the Greek uh, alphabet, first, first and the last letter. And then he, he says the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And what we were pointing out in the admonition at the end is that everything begins and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, that, that's the emphasis of that verse 13. And, and we know that to be true in the sense of creation. It began with him. He created all things. And it's going to end with him. And we're reading about the end of this world in the book of Revelation. Uh, but at the same time, it's not the end totally because there'll be a new beginning. We started out Revelation chapter 21 where new heaven, new earth, uh, new Jerusalem. And so what, God, what he creates, he does have an eternal purpose for. And so it all begins and ends with him. Time itself begins and ends with him. And, and there is some indication, as you read some verses we studied last week, if you look at them closely, it indicates that there's still time in eternity future. But there is an eternity future. But our whole emphasis was to talk about your very existence. Uh, every day of your life, you need to realize that your very existence centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get up in the morning, you need to realize that he's the beginning of your life. And he's the end of your life, even if you have eternal life, because then you go into eternity future. So that your whole life centers around him, about his, his will, his purpose, which is eternal. And, and your very existence centers around the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's something that, you know, we, the world, we get up in the morning and we think of all the things that we got to do. But sometimes we're not thinking about what is our purpose in life. And it all begins with the Lord Jesus Christ and ends with the Lord Jesus Christ. But that doesn't, your purpose in, light, in this life, it also has a purpose in eternity future of serving him. So there, we, we took the time to make sure that we closed last week with that admonition. Verse 11 was a reminder that it says in verse 11, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. That is, the, that is the statement that's made at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. At his second coming, people's eternal destiny is fixed. When we studied the book of Revelation, we realized God's going to go through seven years of judgment upon this world before Jesus Christ actually returns. And upon his return, their, seat, their state is, is sealed. One of the means of sealing their state, their condition, is there's going to be a mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is to agree to worship the Antichrist, which is really indwelt by Satan, as God, rather than worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they take the mark of the beast, their fate 
eternal destiny is sealed. And so at the second coming of Christ, that's the statement there in verse 11 uh, about the fate being sealed, which is really important for you to realize that where we live today in the dispensation of God's grace, we haven't even entered in those last seven years of tribulation. <laughs> the expression, what was it, wholesale salvation or whatever he said <laughs> in the prayer uh, this morning is absolutely true. God has postponed his wrath because he's not willing that any should perish. And he's not fixing anybody's destiny right now. All men have an opportunity. In fact, we often say this, that God's not sending anyone to hell. We send ourselves to hell by not taking advantage of the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When the Lord Jesus Christ came to the earth the first time, he came to die and pay for our sins and, and rise from the dead. When he saved the Apostle Paul, he sent the Apostle Paul out to all mankind, not just dealing with the Jewish people, but all men today, to let us know that his blood is called the propitiation for our sins, the full satisfying payment for our sin. God who is holy has to be a just God. And, and he, he has to judge sin for what it is. And he has to fulfill his purpose that the sinner, the soul that sinneth, it must die. And it must be eternally separated from God because he's holy. You can't dwell in the presence of sin. But the Lord Jesus Christ died and paid the penalty of our sin, fully satisfying the justice of God that our sin has a payment. Not just a covering, but a full payment. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God gives you eternal life. And the one, one of the means that he does that, he imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Jesus never sinned. He puts it to your account on the basis of faith. That's called justification. That you're justified by believing what Jesus Christ accomplished in your behalf and you trust that blood as the payment for your sin. God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account and sees you in Christ as righteous as Jesus Christ. And that's all because of the, the cross work of Christ. And so you can kind of see that in verse 11 there. He that is unjust at the end of Jesus Christ comes back if they're unjust, let them be unjust still, he's doomed. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still, he's doomed. But it goes on to say, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Well, how do you get righteous before God? You believe on Jesus Christ, and the Old Testament talks about them being clothed in the righteousness of God. We have the righteousness imputed to our account, that's on the basis of faith. And so he that is righteous, that's a saved person. Let him be uh, righteous still. He that is holy, that's set apart unto God for his purpose. And they're going to go into eternity future for a purpose of, that God has for us. Let him be holy still. So, so that, that is a reminder there that we're, where we are as we start talking about these verses of Scripture. The... And that, that's where I'm, I'm going with this. Last week, I did a, a several things. One of the things I pointed out, if you kind of look back at Revelation 22, in verse 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, if you haven't been with us, where, where we're talking about is in Revelation chapter 21, it ended where Jesus Christ has, in the end of chapter 20, Jesus Christ came back to earth, he returned in chapter 19. He reigns on earth for a thousand years. And then after the thousand years, there's this great white throne judgment where sinners are, are expelled. And then chapter 21 talks about the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. And, and so you begin to get a description in chapter 21 of the new city of God that comes out of heaven and is established on the earth. It's called New Jerusalem. And there's all kinds of details, and we went through those details describing the New Jerusalem. When you begin chapter 22, you're still talking about New Jerusalem, and there in the city of New Jerusalem, in verse 2, it says, In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruit, and yield her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. The, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And so there's the tree of life back on earth again. And, and so what, in verse chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, continue to describe what's the new Jerusalem and what's in the new Jerusalem. In verse 6, and it was a real important point last week, we talked about the vision of Revelation came to an end. The vision of Revelation began in chapter 1, and, and John in chapter 4 is taken into heaven and seen things from a heavenly view, 
And then it all comes to a conclusion at the end of chapter 22, verse 5. And 22, verse 6 says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful. And this is the angel talking to John. And he said unto me, These things are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant things which must shortly be done. So there's a break between 5, verse 5 and verse 6, where verse 6 takes us back to John receiving the revelation of the whole book. These sayings are the, every, everything from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22, verse 5. So he's done seeing the visions, and, and now the angel is given this information and telling John these things are faithful and true. So there's a break there. And that's real important because we're asking ourselves as we begin in verse 6, where are we? And, and it's important for you to understand for a real good reason. Look over in verse 14 and 15 where we're heading. Verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the, through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So a question has come up. Gary Schiller has asked me this question for years. Anytime I got to Revelation 22, what does verse 15 mean that outside the city are all these sinners? And two weeks ago, I ended with, uh, well, I forget what verse I ended with, uh, that Dave Smith read ahead. And so he met me in the back and said, what is verse 15 telling us? is the reason I put this picture on there, when we talked about the New Jerusalem, we talked about the dimensions the Bible gives us of how big that city is. And laid over a map of the Middle East, we realize it goes from the Mediterranean Sea. Now, I think the land mass is going to be different by the time you come to after the thousand year, first the seven years of tribulation, and then during the thousand year reign of Christ, I think the land mass will be different. But the whole point is, is that if that city was coming down today, it would reach from the Mediterranean all the way through the uh, uh, Iran, <laughs> which I think is really funny because they hate Israel. Uh, but anyhow, that's where the New Jerusalem is going to be. But verse 15, when it says, For without are dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Does that mean every place outside that yellow area are full of sinners? And we're in the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Are there still sinners around? And when you look at that, that you know, it seems, you know, verse 14, it's talking about who can get, enter and then who can't. And, then, uh, and so that question comes up. But part of the answer to that question is to realize when, you're over, when you start in Revelation 22 and you get verse 6, you got to ask yourself, where are we? What is being said in light of where John is at in the revelation he's receiving? And you'll realize then that is going to be the answer to the question. So, where are we? Now, I put an arrow there on, the, on our time chart. You realize we live in the dispensation of grace today where God has postponed his wrath. If you see the wrath of God, that's the seven years of tribulation that are, that's going to come to the earth. And then Jesus Christ is going to come back and reign for a thousand years. And there's going to be another rebellion after the thousand years. And then there's the great white throne judgment where people are finally, the, the damned of the ages are cast in the lake of fire. And then eternity future begins. My point is, is as we read these verses, we're not in eternity future. We, ever since verse 6, we're back there before the beginning of the tribulation. Let me, let me point that out to you. It says in, uh, in verse 7, Behold, I, well, no, I should start with verse 6. Verse 6 says, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, the Lord, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servant things which must shortly be done. So John is receiving a revelation of things that aren't done yet, but they're going to be done in the prophetic program very soon. God has interrupted the prophetic program for the age of grace, but when the prophetic program begins again, it's going to be shortly be done. So when you read verse 6, you realize you're at the beginning of the tribulation. It didn't even start yet. It's going to shortly be done. Then you read verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Well, you realize that's after the seven years, and we're predicting Jesus Christ's coming. 
So you're actually back at the beginning, before the tribulation begins, with, with things that are going to take place during that seven years of, of wrath, and, and then Jesus Christ is going to come back after that seven years of wrath. So the people who are at the beginning have this hope that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes, he's going to come quickly. It's only going to be seven years, no more delays. And so that's where we are as we begin to study from verse 6 all the way to the end of the chapter. That John is broke, the vision is over, and he's back to the very beginning of what things, the visions are all about. And that tells you where we are. Interestingly, when it says in verse 12, where we did our scripture reading, Behold, I come quickly. Notice that the Lord says that three times in this chapter. First in verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Then in verse 12, Behold, I come quickly. And then at verse 20, it says, Surely I come quickly. So there's an encouragement there that the Lord is going to come quickly when he comes. It's seven years, and, and it talks about that those days were any longer. It would, the saint would be able to deceive the very elect, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. They're not going any further than that. Interestingly, too, when you look at each one of those, Behold, I come quickly, blessed are they that keep. So he's coming quickly to bless. When you look at verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. So he's not only going to come back and bless, he's going to reward the, the faithful. And then in verse 20, he, he, he which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. <laughs> and you love that, how that ends. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And, uh, and that's really the, the encouragement, the hope of those that are going to go through the tribulation that the Lord has promised. He's going to come quickly, and so they're looking forward for him to come back. And, and then when he comes back, he's going to set up his kingdom for a thousand years, and then one final judgment, and then there's eternity future. So um, that, th those are the promises that are given to us. Now, when we get to verse 14, uh, I'll pick up there. In verse 14, it says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the, through the gates into the city. When you come to verses 14 and 15, what you're learning about is those who will be able to enter into the new Jerusalem when it comes, and verse 15, who will not be allowed to enter in when it comes. That's the, that's the basis of those two verses. The blessed are those that have the right to enter into the city. And that's a real important to realize what it's saying there in verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life. They're not entering into the city right now. He's talking about those that will have the right later to enter into the city. So they still got to go through the tribulation. And then there's going to be the thousand year reign of Christ. And the blessed are those that at the end of the thousand years are going to be allowed to go into the New Jerusalem. But they're not entering. That's the whole point. They're not entering the New Jerusalem right now. They, they have, the blessed have the right to enter in. So that when you come to verse 15, when it says, For, for without are dogs, sorcerers, murder, uh, whoremongers, uh, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie, these, when it says those that are without, those are the ones that are not going to have the right. And it's interesting, in, in verse 20, in verse 14, they, those that have the right, they may enter in through the gate of the city. So they have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gate of the city. Well, where is the tree of life at? It's in the city. So in order to get to the tree of life, you have to enter into the city to ever get to the tree of life. And again, that's a reminder that during the, there, there is already, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at that second coming, after the wrath, there is a resurrection of the Old Testament saints. They're already blessed. So what we're talking about here are those who make it through the thousand year reign of Christ and are still counted to be blessed. After they make it through that thousand year reign of Christ, they will be allowed to enter into the city and if you enter into the city, I think the very first place you want to go is to the tree of life so that you can go on for all eternity, have eternal life. And, and so those, during that, the, the, those that before the thousand years, the saints have all been raised and they've ruled and reigned with Christ for that thousand years. But there's people born during that thousand years. 
and they are going to have a right to the tree of life when the tree of life gets here after the thousand years after that final judgment they're going to be able to enter into the city and once you enter the city you can eat of the tree of life when it says in verse 15 for without what we're talking about is those who aren't allowed to enter into the city and if you can't enter into the city guess what you can't do you can't eat of the tree of life and therefore these group of people are going to be damned for all eternity and they're not, going to, they're not going to have a right to enter the city, a right to eat of the tree of life. The word without there makes it sound like they exist outside the city. I'll point out to you that they don't exist outside the city. One of the ways you know that is when you started in chapter 21, there's a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem, and there's nothing but righteousness in all three of those places. So there... The, 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 the whoremongers and, and all the things that are listed there in verse 15, they don't exist in, on the earth in eternity future. They've been taken care of before eternity future. So, but there's two things I want to point out to you. And I say this about that word without. Interestingly, Pete today when teaching Sunday school referred to people that you're not to keep company with. And he read a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He ended in verse 11, but verse 12 says, Paul said to the Corinthians, Do I judge them that are without? Do ye not judge them that are within? What he's saying, those that are without are outside of salvation. Those who are outside of, of Jesus Christ's people. And, and you don't judge people who are, are lost sinners. God is their judge. But as believers, we do judge one another and make sure that we're living properly. And so, but it's that phrase, without. See, the ones that are without, they're without Christ. They're without hope. They're without God. They're going to be damned. Uh, those that are within, they're, they're the ones that are blessed in verse 14. So it's interesting how that statement. But in, in verse 14, there's something else I want to point out to you. And that is that word in verse 14 that begins, blessed are they that do his commandments. Now, let me first point this out. If you look back at verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly, there is a blessed. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the book of this prophecy. If that is being said to those that are at the beginning of the tribulation, looking for Jesus Christ to come back at the end of the tribulation, to keep the sayings of the book is to worship Jesus Christ. Believe on Jesus Christ. Believe Jesus is the Christ. Because there's going to be an anti-Christ who's going to claim he's the Christ. And he's going to tell you you have to take his mark and bow down and worship him for you to be able to buy or sell. So when you read verse 7, that's what you have in mind. Blessed, the, the blessed people are those that keep the sayings of the book of the prophecy of this book. Believe on Jesus Christ, not on the anti-Christ. But notice the difference in verse 12. Uh, verse 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the, the gates into the city. Now, blessed are they that keep his, uh, that do his commandments. Well, that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, if you study the prophets, you realize Jesus Christ is going to rule the nations with a rod of iron and that the law of the Lord is going to flow out of Jerusalem to the world. And Jesus Christ is going to put them under law and hold them accountable to the law. So that when you read verse 12, you're not talking about the beginning of the tribulation. You're talking about those who will make it, that will be called blessed after that thousand year reign. That during that thousand year reign, they have kept his commandments. The verse 14, I keep saying 12. Verse 14, they kept his commandments. So you realize verse 7 is talking about before the tribulation, and verse 14 are talking about those who lived during that thousand year reign of Christ. Then of course, verse 20 is about <laughs> just looking for the Lord to come back. Um, so anyhow, you, you see that difference there. But the reason I started bringing up verse 14, that word blessed, does that, you know, if you read your Bible, some things ought to come to your mind. Like you remember the Lord had a sermon on the mount. It's recorded in one of the places in Matthew chapter 5. And where he goes through 11 times talking about the blessed. If I can remember these. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, uh, for they shall be comforted. 
Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those that, are hung, that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Uh, blessed are the pure of heart, um, um, they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, um, for they shall be, uh, 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 they shall, uh, uh, anyhow, they, they're, they're be in the kingdom of God. I forget exactly how that says. Blessed are, blessed are they that are persecuted um, for the Lord's sake, and, and he's going to take care of them. And then finally, blessed is the man, uh, uh, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and so forth, for great is your reward. Well, that's everything we're reading right here. And the reason I say that to you, there's two things. One, when you read the book of Matthew, when you read that Sermon on the Mount, that's not talking about the dispensation of grace. That's preparing the nation of Israel for those who are going to be blessed uh, at his coming and, 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 uh, and enter into that kingdom. Uh, that they're going to be shown mercy, they're going to give it righteousness, and, and they're going to enter into that kingdom uh, that he's going to establish. So when we're reading here about in verse 14 about blessed, I want you to realize that that's seven times that appears in the book of Revelation. I think I got it listed here. But I do want to, you got a Bible in front of you, so even though there's a little cheating up there, it's easy. Turn back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. It, it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of the prophecy of, of this, of the words of this prophecy, and keep those sayings which are written therein. So you start out where you're being told to uh, those that are blessed, uh, are the, the ones who are going to be blessed are those who read and hear and keep the prophecies that's in this book. In other words, don't worship the Antichrist. Interesting, you come over to chapter 14 where the Antichrist now has established the mark of the beast. And if you don't take his mark, you're going to lose your head. Look over in chapter 14. And in verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the, Lord, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. They're going to have to take up their cross and follow the Lord. And when they do, will not deny the Lord Jesus Christ, some of them are going to lose their head. And, and so it says, blessed are the, the dead which die in the Lord. So those are the people that are in Christ. And when they die, they rest and they'll be resurrected at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which at this point is just three and a half years later. So you have that expression. Then in chapter 16, verse 15. And by the way, that list, there's seven times they're called blessed in chapter 16 and verse 17 it says and the seventh angel poured out his vial upon the air am I, am I reading the wrong verse 15 yes verse 15 says behold I come as a thief blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame so they're going to keep righteous they're going to look for the Lord Jesus Christ they're watching for him to come and they are the ones that are called the blessed then in chapter 19, verse 9. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These, these are the true sayings of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is preparing to come back and he's going to join himself with the believing remnant of Israel. They're the bride of Christ. And ultimately they're going to be put into the new Jerusalem, which is the bride of Christ. They're going to be united together in Christ and then in that new Jerusalem, and they are called the blessed. And then in chapter 20, in verse 6, it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Now, Jesus Christ has come back, and as soon as he comes back, there's a, those that are going to be raised before he reigns a thousand years. Those that are raised after the thousand years are going to be damned. But, so it says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So blessed are those that are going to, that when Jesus Christ comes back, are resurrected, and they reign with him for that thousand years. 
And then in chapter 22, verse 7, we've already talked about this. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And then in verse 14, where we're studying, blessed is he that do his commandments. One is the one who made it through the tribulation. The other one is going through the thousand year reign of Christ and are going to be blessed after that. So it's interesting that, that so many things in the book of Revelation have seven occurrences. And that word blessed has seven occurrences. It speaks about uh, those that are going to have life in Christ. Another interesting point about that, and I read this and I had to check it out. Just like we said, it starts in Matthew chapter 5, we're saying blessed, 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 and then here we see it through the book of Revelation seven times. That when you come to verse 14, when it says blessed, that's the 50th time in your Bible that there's a special word that's translated blessed that actually means extremely blessed. And it's the 50th time that's used in the Bible. And, and that's quite interesting because if you understand some things, 50 is the number of jubilee of the Old Testament. And if you, you can, Leviticus, I'm going to read to you some passages in Leviticus chapter 25. Because what, what the day of jubilee is, is th that is, Israel's going to count, every seven years they had to let the land rest. Then every seven times seven years, I mean 49 years, they not only let the land rest, but on the 50th year they call it a jubilee. And the reason it's called a jubilee is all debts are forgiven people. And people who got poor and sold their inheritance, now their inheritance comes back to them. Because the inheritance that God's going to give them is an everlasting inheritance, so they don't lose it forever when they became poor and sold it. They, only sell, they sold it only to the year of jubilee, then it comes back to them. And so the, the year of jubilee is really important. So in chapter 25, in verse, what do I want to read? Start in verse 8. It says, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seventh, uh, space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. So the Bible helped you do some math there. Uh, but you realize they work six days, the seventh day was a day of rest. And then you can go about the seventh month, what that meant, uh, that's a day of atonement. And, and you realize how seven is important in, in Israel. Now you've got seven times seven years, come out to the 49th year. Verse 9 says, Then shalt thou cause the, trump, the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall, ye, shall the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall, proclaim, you shall hollow the, seven, the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. Ye shall return every man to, unto his possession, and ye shall uh, return every man to, unto his family. And that has to do with their debts cleared and their inheritance coming back to them. Year of jubilee. Well, in, in Revelation 22, verse 14, when it says blessed, you realize the jubilee that's there? They're blessed going into eternity future. They're going to have a right to go in and eat of the tree of life in, in that. And all debts are forgiven them because Christ paid for their sins. And they're going to be a part of an everlasting inheritance that God has for them. And it's the 50th time that God said blessed. Which point, you know, it, those things are said in scripture just to, like I said, I knew I needed to share some things with you that are important in the book of Revelation. That's one of those things that I just couldn't just pass up that I needed to share with you. There's another thing. Back to Revelation 22 and verse 15. So just like verse 14 is very special, verse 15 says, for without. Now those are those that are not going to have a right to enter into the city and eat the tree of life. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Now, if you've been with us in a study of the book of Revelation, some of that sounds really familiar to you. And if not, I'll help you out. <laughs> Look, flap, just flip back to chapter 21. And this is after the thousand-year reign of Christ. And at the end of the thousand-year reign, all the damned of the ages are brought before Jesus Christ and cast into the lake of fire forever. And so there's a warning in chapter 21 and verse 8. As you go into that thousand-year reign of Christ, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars 
shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. Now that takes place before the thousand year reign of Christ. And you recognize a lot of those things are on that same list? If you compare the list of chapter 21 verse 8 and 22 verse 15, 22 15 starts out differently. It just says, for without are dogs. In your Bible, dogs are unclean people. They're unclean before God. After it says dogs, everything else on that list matches what you just read in chapter 21, verse 8, about those that are cast into the lake of fire. So, so a couple things about that. First of all, in the list in chapter 21, it starts out with the fearful, unbelieving, and abominable. That matches they that are without are dogs. And I, I, we, we took the time to look at that in chapter 21, verse 8. The fearful, those who are afraid to trust Jesus Christ. Unbelieving, those who have decided not to trust in Jesus Christ. The abominable, those who decided to take the mark of the beast and worship the Antichrist. Those three are all unclean, they're dogs. Then the rest of the list, the order is just a little bit different, but there's murders, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and it ends with liars. Chapter 22 ends with love, loveth and maketh a lie. And, and, and those that are going to follow the lie of Satan rather than the truth of God, they don't love the truth of God that they might be saved, the Bible talks about. They all have their place in the lake of fire. So that tells you that verse 15, those people are damned before the thousand years begins. They're not there after the thousand years to, to enter into the, to be in existence in the new earth outside the city of Jerusalem. That's not what verse 15 is about. Those people have been taken care of already in chapter 21 verse 8 at the second coming of Christ or after the thousand year reign of Christ before, eterni before the, the uh, eternity future begins. So I just wanted to point that out to you as well. So let's move to verse 16. And this is where we won't finish today, but I do want to say something about the beginning here. Well, first of all, I want to point out to you, when you get to verse 16, you notice it starts out, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And that is the assemblies that will be existing when the tribulation begins. That's what chapters 2 and 3 are all about in the book of Revelation. And so John is reminded that he, he's sent to those churches. He's got to write them special messages sent from Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is uh, I, I have a Bible that has the Lord's words in red. I don't know if you have that or not. But it gets confusing to me. Any, a lot of times when you read about where they think the Lord is talking, sometimes I wonder if they got it right. For instance, let me just say that the Lord is going to speak directly. Now, we know the angel started talking to John, and then he gets interrupted in verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. That's the Lord Jesus Christ now speaking, not the angel talking to John. When you get over to verse 12, and behold, I come quickly, the Lord speaks again, and it makes that statement. When you get to verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things. The Lord is speaking. Now, as we go through the rest of, of, of this chapter, I have a hard time figuring out where the Lord quits speaking. I do know that when you get over in verse 20, he that testify these things saith. So that's John's narration. And then the one testifying is the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus Christ say? Surely I come quickly. So that's the four times the Lord speaks in this chapter. What I don't know is... In verse 17, 18, and 19, who's speaking? The, 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 the way I have it in my Bible, it's like John or the angel is saying these things. But, but if you just kind of just jump over in verse 18 for right now, he says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Who said that? I have a suspicion that's the Lord Jesus Christ still speaking. I don't think he stopped in verse 17. Uh, I think that invitation that's there in verse 17 and the warning in verse 18 and 19 are still coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think there's an interruption at verse 20, but the last part is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking again. Whether you agree with that or not, that outline is what we want to look at. And that is, when you get to verse 16, 
when the Lord speaks, he's given his identity. And we're going to at least cover that today. Then we'll pick up next week, where in verse 17, where it says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. There's an invitation here for anyone. I'll finish the verse. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. God's gift of eternal life is a free gift. And it's whosoever will. There is not God limiting that to anybody. He's offering to all mankind the opportunity to be saved. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt of our sins so that God could... And it's, he paid it all so there's nothing for us to pay. We can receive the gift of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyhow, verse 17 there is the invitation of Jesus Christ. Verse 18 and 19 is a warning from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 20 is the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to come quickly. So let's, just, let's just conclude with verse 16 today. He said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you things in the churches. And notice he gives his identity. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Maybe I'll only take one of those today. I am the root and the offspring of David. Now David's the great king of the nation of Israel that established them as a kingdom. Jesus Christ is going to come back and he's of the seed of David and he's going to establish his kingdom. When you start out the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ is of the seed of David, is of the seed of Abraham. He's come to fulfill the promises made to Abraham and to David. He's going to establish his kingdom here on earth. First there's a thousand year and then it's eternity future when that new Jerusalem comes. But when he identifies himself, he identifies himself as the root and offspring of David. Now how can you be both? How can you be the root of David and the offspring of David? Well, remember who Jesus Christ is. He's the Creator God. All things begin and end with Him. He created David. And then He comes as a man through David. And so He is both the root and offspring of David. Matthew chapter 12. This is good, so don't give, me, don't give up on me yet. Matthew chapter 12, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Pharisees, the religious people of his day, were rejecting him. And he sets them straight. And he, he asked them a question, and they couldn't answer it, and it's the end of questions. I got Matthew chapter 12, right? Okay. Oh, it's Matthew 22. That's why I couldn't find it. <laughs> Matthew 22, verse 42. Sorry about that. No. Oh, 22. Yeah, yeah I'm alive. Chapter 22, verse 42. So verse 41 says, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they said unto him, The son of David. Now Christ means the Messiah. They knew a Messiah was going to come. And so they knew he was going to come of the seed of David. So they answered. They, they, they're rejecting Jesus Christ, but they know the Messiah will become through the son of David. Verse 43. And he said unto them, How then doth David in spirit call him Lord? saying, and he quotes a psalm, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then called him Lord, how is he his son? <laughs> no father calls their son Lord. <laughs> Maybe the son should call the father Lord. <laughs> but here David is calling his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord. And he's calling him my Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ asked the Pharisee, How is that? That he is, that David would call his son Lord. Well, that's, we're learning the answer to that in Revelation chapter 22, are we not? He is the root and the offspring of David. David knew that of his seed, God was going to come in the form of a man and set up a kingdom here on this earth. And Jesus Christ, who's the creator, became a man through virgin birth of the seed of David and then, and then is setting up his kingdom on earth. So Jesus Christ is giving his identity. That's only one part of his identity. 
We'll pick up the second part of that identity next week and, and finish out the book of Revelation uh, as we conclude uh, next week. But the Lord Jesus Christ gives his identity here when all men ought to realize who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He is the creator God who became a man, first to die for our sins so we could be, have salvation f as a free gift from God, and then the second to come back and set up his kingdom on this earth, a kingdom that will reach even to the heavens. And we've studied that already. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we rush through a lot of information because there's just a lot of information in your Bible. I pray there's been something here for each person, especially if there's any among us that never realized that they don't need to be afraid to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. They should not make a decision not to believe on him as their Savior. And certainly if they don't believe on him, they're gonna believe something else, which is Satan is the God of this world. So Father, I do pray that each person would realize your gift and offer to them of eternal life through Jesus Christ, through his death as a payment for our sin, his burial and his resurrection. Then Father, I pray that the, the rest of us will realize and, and keep in our minds who our Savior is. And not only one who came to die for us, but the one who created us. And for thus, those of us who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, the eternal purpose you have for us. May, you serve, may we serve you now and look forward to serving you throughout all eternity. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.